being recorded. And if you have any questions, feel free to enter them in the chat, and I will be taking your questions at the end. And for now, I'm going to turn off my camera and move on to the presentation. So I want to first thank Kristen and Mount St. Mary College for inviting me to present to you today on this critically important area in higher education. My name is Nazalie Kirkjian, and I'm the coordinator of Disability, Diversity, and Non-Traditional Student Services within the Office of University Life at SUNY System Administration. Prior to my role at SUNY, I worked in the Services for Students with Disabilities Office at Binghamton University, both as an undergraduate student and as a professional. I worked very closely with faculty and professional staff to ensure equal access to our students with disabilities. And now, at SUNY Administration, I serve as the liaison to the Campus Disability Services offices across SUNY. I'm going to briefly go over some key concepts and spend the remaining time sharing the scope of accessibility as it pertains to websites and information technologies and ways to support and sustain accessible living and learning environments. So accessibility is really all about our ability to engage with, use, participate in, and belong to the world around us. With respect to web accessibility, accessible means that one can access websites with or without assistive technology, such as a screen reader. The image on the screen provides a more legalistic definition of accessibility. Basically, that students with disabilities are entitled to the same opportunities as their non-disabled peers. Many of you might be familiar with Universal Design for Learning, which is a set of principles that emphasizes the importance of flexibility and creating adaptive environments that minimize barriers and meet the needs of all students. Universal Design and accessibility are very complementary. So, you know, universal design is about providing access for people with diverging needs without treating them differently. Design guides how we interact with the world around us, and its influence is profound. We also need to examine our social conditioning, though, because society often views disability in a medical sense, meaning that disabilities are perceived as abnormal or unhealthy. And this suggests that problems facing persons with disabilities lie in the individual. As such, um, we, society, institutions of higher education, are often reactive and wait for individuals and students to disclose to our institution before providing them access in an alternate manner. Um, and so, you know, what we really want to focus on is that people with disabilities are people first and that they should be treated with respect. We must recognize that barriers exist in the environment. And if we intentionally design environments with accessibility in mind from the beginning, instead of as an afterthought, we would open doors to far more people. The social model of disability is a more proactive and inclusive way of approaching web accessibility and really emphasizes the concept of shared responsibility, which I will continue to talk about throughout this presentation. So, we're all here because web accessibility is a growing concern. Uh, we know that our enrollments of students with disabilities are increasing. Uh, there's 11% of students in post-secondary institutions who self-identify as having a disability. So that doesn't even count the amount of students who don't disclose to our offices. Uh, then the number of students with learning disabilities has tripled over the past three decades in post-secondary institutions. And 20% of the population has a disability that impacts access to websites and mobile. In New York State, there are over 60,000 self-identified students with disabilities in higher education. And the private colleges enroll the most self-identified students with disabilities representing 44% of all post-secondary students with disabilities in New York State. The way that we're conducting business in our living and learning environments is changing. We're increasingly digital, we use more technology, and our students expect it. And so naturally, with the increase of students with disabilities and the increasing use of web and technologies, we're more aware of accessibility and its impact for individuals with various disabilities. 
Now, technology has opened doors for people with disabilities, but technology can be a barrier or the solution, depending on design. So poor design uh, can exclude users to equal opportunities to access our campus programs, services, and activities. And this is, at its core, an equity issue because while enrollment is increasing, there are retention and completion gaps for our students with disabilities. Students with disabilities are significantly more likely to drop out of college than those without disabilities. And even in New York State, 18% of New Yorkers aged 21 to 64 years old with disabilities uh, have an educational attainment of a bachelor's degree or higher compared to 39% of New Yorkers without disabilities. So there's pretty serious gap um, for, our for our college age students uh, with disabilities. We know that people with disabilities face higher in unemployment rates and are more likely to live in poverty. What we do know is that accommodations and supports help. And thankfully, we have some federal legislation to provide um, you know, some information as to how we provide equal opportunities to our students under the Americans with Disabilities Act and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Although the language of the ADA does not explicitly mention the internet, the department has taken the position that Title III covers access to websites and public accommodations. So what does this mean for us? You know, several states systems of higher education and individual campuses have made web accessibility a priority um, and both in two-year and four-year institutions. And although it's not explicitly mentioned in the ADA, states have taken, uh, have adopted some of these technical standards. I do have to tell you that New York State is behind other states in web accessibility efforts. There is a New York State information technology policy uh, that addresses accessibility of websites, but this only applies to state entities like SUNY and CUNY. Um, so we're kind of left on our own to devise policies and procedures to support web accessibility. <clears throat> so you may be wondering how individuals with disabilities use the websites. Uh, and so really they use various assistive technologies uh, in auxiliary aids and services. So Auxiliary tech, uh, or assistive technologies are technologies used by individuals with disabilities to access computers and digital information. It could be screen readers, literacy and text-to-speech software, uh, voice recognition software. And then there's auxiliary aids and services, such as closed captions or even note-taking software, which provide effective communication for those with hearing loss or auditory, auditory processing disorders. So these technologies, aids, and services ultimately provide our students and, and individuals with disabilities independence. Having these readily available on your campus is best practice so that visitors, employees, and students with disabilities, including those who may not have formally registered with the Disability Services Office, would benefit. Uh, fortunately, I've learned that you do have some of these uh, technologies readily available on your campus such as Read and Write Gold. You could use these in the classroom or simply share that this technology is available for your students. Some examples of what other campuses have done with this kind of uh, technology, SUNY Oneonta's Campus Disability Service Office employed students to examine assistive technology and engage faculty to integrate assistive technology campus-wide. So you could make this a research project uh, with your students. Other campuses have added mindfulness apps in freshman year experience courses or acquired licenses for the entire campus. So there's this app called the Palm College app and it's being used at Cornell University and at NYU. This app offers guided meditations and other interventions to support mental health and build resiliency. People without disabilities also benefit from many of these tools. We know that students use transcripts as study guides. English language learners use some of the study skills literacy software. And we use voice recognition software to play music or send emails. So there are many ways to integrate this for people with and without disabilities. And so 
you know, here's a visual demonstration of how individuals with permanent disabilities, temporary disabilities, and persons in situational context may benefit from inclusive web design. It really is more than just the 20%. Now, while my presentation emphasizes websites, it's important to understand the scope of what we need to consider to be inclusive. Websites definitely have the greatest impact, particularly public-facing websites, but it's really not just websites. Nowadays, it's hard to imagine academia without third-party products and services. So software and hardware accessibility needs to be considered too. Uh, if you use personal response systems in the classroom, uh, you know, those need to be considered as well. And this applies to all sorts of things, whether it's course registration software or the college application, uh, emails or library database materials, anything you can think of accessibility should be integrated in those considerations. So for our purposes today, think of how these considerations apply to instructional content, communications and marketing content, which could include social media, uh, student affairs departments, multimedia, library collections, and other web-based software used to facilitate core program services and activities. Generally speaking, uh, these accessible design principles apply broadly. Uh, they apply to content, platforms, and devices. I'll just give you a quick overview of, of what you know, these considerations entail, uh, but I've shared with Kristen a handout that goes into more detail as to what each consideration means and why it is important. Basically, we we'll want to ensure that navigation is clear and consistent. We use legible fonts. We use headings and built-in lists, sufficient color contrast, avoiding using color to convey meaning alone, uh, use what's called alt text descriptions for things like images, tables, equations, maps, and so on. We provide intelligibly captioned multimedia and possibly descriptive audio or transcripts. Uh, we ensure that are, we have high quality scans with little to no highlighting or handwriting on them. We have PDFs that are text renderable, uh, meaning they are searchable, they are tagged and structured appropriately, use meaningful hyperlinks, avoid phrases like click here and more here, and use equation editors that output to MathML. For many of these principles, there are built-in free and cost-effective measures to evaluate and achieve accessible content in web design. It's built into Microsoft Office, YouTube, Adobe, and other tools. Many of these considerations require some additional attention and effort to your day-to-day -day routines, but most of it is not substantially time-consuming. And it's becoming more affordable and easier to accomplish every year. And it's also cheaper to provide access in advance than to go back and fix these things retroactively or face litigation. So I know that there are more workshops offered this week to you and hopefully in the future that will go into deeper detail as to how to accomplish these considerations. Generally, you know, what this all means is that graphic and video content is accessible to people who can't see it, audio content is accessible to people who can't hear it, uh, websites can be controlled and manipulated by assistive technology, meaning it doesn't, um, you know, lock them out of using the websites and software. And information may be accessed remotely at home, right? Maybe they're not on your, on your campus, maybe they're at home. So some of the challenges uh, with achieving all of this, post-secondary institutions are increasingly under scrutiny as to their approach for ensuring accessibility in web and information technologies because we struggle with how to address such obligations within the context of policy, procedure, and implementation. And this is largely uh, as a result of kind of unclear IT accessibility related legal requirements. As I mentioned before, it's not included, it's not explicitly written in the ADA or Section 504. And the standards that we do have are highly interpretable. 
On top of that, you know, there's a, kind of a lack of accessibility ownership or executive sponsorship and minimal government, governance, risk management, or compliance processes in place to achieve these. So you have to work together to build workflows to check for accessibility and create or purchase accessible content, websites, software, and so on. Uh, this really is a cooperative effort here because you know, the disability services offices aren't really the ones purchasing all of the all of the publishing content or working with all these other vendors. So everyone has to play some kind of a role in, a, in ensuring that uh, content and products are as accessible as possible. And just because something looks accessible, like a cleanly scanned PDF, or a company says their content or product is accessible, doesn't mean it is. And that's really part of uh, a huge part of the challenge because unfortunately, third-party products and services do not have to meet the same accessibility standards as post-secondary institutions. As, as, as educational entities, we are held responsible for providing access. And so, you know, not everything will be 100% accessible. Exceptions are the norm. So uh, procurement is one of those high impact priority areas that you'll need to discuss strategically moving forward. But it's okay. It takes a campus. So, you know, these are the folks that should be sitting at the table. Uh, there are many ways to ingrain web accessibility into the fabric of the institution nationally and at SUNY. Yeah, these efforts have initially began and even continue today in a grassroots fashion. This is risky and ultimately inequitable. So in order for optimal success, institutional buy-in at every level is super important. Now, roles and responsibilities vary across institutions. Uh, but here's some of what I've observed at other campuses. Senior leadership and administration play a huge role in providing that executive sponsorship. And so, you know, we have a board of trustees. Many campuses do. The Board of Trustees can pass a, pol can pass a policy on web accessibility. Uh, they may be able to assign roles and responsibilities to achieve the goals of the policy. They can possibly allocate funds, uh, allocate and prioritize funds to support accessibility efforts uh, and prioritize compliance and risk management in the context of web accessibility. Academic affairs, uh, you know, academic affairs has a role because they locate and create content for courses. So figuring out uh, workflows or support systems on your campus to support faculty in locating and creating accessible content is important. But also our, our faculty um, are the lifeblood of our institutions and they're the ones talking to publishers, right? So maybe faculty can play a stronger role in pressuring vendors and publishers to, publishers to conform to our accessibility standards. And then finally, they could adopt or endorse the use of assistive technology in the classroom, which will really help stigmatize uh, disability and improve learning outcomes, which is obviously extremely important. The purchasing office has a role. In terms of including accessibility as a requirement for purchasing, this could include gathering relevant documentation from the vendors or making sure that various departments include accessibility when they're considering uh, various products and services. And information technology has a role in terms of supporting infrastructure on our campus, whether that's information security or accessibility, they could be purchasing or installing assistive technology or sustaining and monitoring website accessibility. That, uh, that looks different on every campus. That could be communications and marketing. That could be IT. Um, but, you know, having IT in, the, in all these conversations is really important. If you have a diversity office, it could be disability services who plays more of this role, advising on relevant policies, keeping up to date with assistive technologies, and really the whole uh, in purpose of the disability services office is to support the students who self-identify to their office and provide accommodations and provide very specialized accommodations, right? So we wouldn't necessarily expect faculty to create their content in Braille, but 
that might be the re that is likely the responsibility of the disability service office. That's a very specialized accommodation. Marketing and communications, they have to maintain uh, accessible web design uh, for and communications if they are in control of the websites or other social media. Legal counsel has a role uh, in terms of ensuring the policies are sound and establishing language to include accessibility in RFPs and contract writers. Libraries also have a really critical role to play. And like faculty, they could also pressure vendors and publishers to support accessibility. And they could also provide assistive technology in the libraries. And finally, they could establish processes for offering library services to patrons with disabilities, such as research assistant and scanning OCR. And it's totally possible that you all already do some of these things, but making sure they're communicated uh, is, is huge so that your students, visitors, and employees know that this, these are options for them. The Centers for Learning and Teaching, Distance Learning, Faculty Development type offices, you know, they could offer course reviews that incorporate accessibility or offer professional development such as this. Uh, and, and extra how-tos for accessible course design. And so I know you're doing a lot of this already, uh, but communicate it. And you know, to really ingrain this, you could put some of these responsibilities into job descriptions. So this really emphasizes a shared approach with mechanisms and supports in place to fulfill the institution's goal of access and inclusion. And we can accomplish these by uh, creating policies and procedures that explicitly identify technical standards, definitions, scope, and exceptions, because like I said, there will be exceptions. And that could also uh, identify roles and responsibilities uh, for those various stakeholders in achieving the policy. Obviously, professional development is important. We were not taught this stuff growing up. Um, technology has rapidly evolved in our understanding of technology uh, and access to uh, individuals with disabilities is evolving. It's a continuous learning process and so professional development is important as new uh, updates and new products are purchased. You know, uh, it, these aren't really one size fits all. These products and, and websites aren't created all the same and so uh, you know, training is essential. Something uh, that is really popular across SUNY and at other campuses across the country are standing committees, working groups, or liaison systems uh, to assure that accessibility is achieved. And then various tools and services, such as automated testing of, you know, scanning websites, document remediation services, or captioning services, may be tools to help achieve accessible web environments. So specifically, at SUNY, uh, we have a plethora of policies and interventions in place. I do have to tell you that, you know, our campuses vary in their accessibility culture. Um, you know, we have campuses that are more of your size, and then we have university centers that are 30,000 plus uh, enrolled students. and so. Uh, the resources vary, the expertise varies, and so we are working systematically to improve uh, access to information about accessibility. And so one of the things we're doing is we're in the process of proposing an electronic and information technology accessibility policy to the SUNY Board of Trustees. Um, and the intent is for this policy to apply to all 64 campuses. Now campuses can have their own policies, but we would really like to uh, make this a priority at SUNY, and we are proposing that every campus designate an EIT accessibility officer uh, and establish a campus accessibility action plan. And this is all still evolving, so nothing is set in stone, but we do hope to bring this forward to our Board of Trustees in June. And some of what our campuses are doing, uh, a number of campuses have enacted policies specifically to address web accessibility, or they've included web accessibility in broader web content policies. Uh, so we have a good chunk of campuses that have accessibility information readily available on the front page of campus websites. 
Some of them have more websites dedicated to support faculty and staff in designing, locating, and monitoring accessible content. We also have a uh, SUNY Center for Professional Development who provide various workshops and courses for our campuses. Uh, so I, I really want to emphasize, again, the shared responsibility model where accessibility is everybody's responsibility and inclusion efforts are supported by faculty and staff across divisions and departments with support, of course. So, you know, SUNY New Pulse has a collective effort between IT, marketing, communications, and instructional technology, and together they share responsibilities to support the campus community by offering general training, offering remediation drop-in hours, and, and things like that. Uh, we have campuses that have working groups uh, to improve existing accessibility efforts and further quality assurance. SUNY Cortland has a Technology Accessibility Advisory Council, which is chaired by their Chief Information Officer. And Columbia Green Community College recently formed a website committee. So that is uh, really been increasing over the past year, is a bunch of campuses are creating or revisiting the website accessibility through committees and working groups. Other innovative practices include some of those automated processes, uh, Mohawk Valley Community Colleges has an automated website testing, accessibility testing tool. Onondaga Community College has a tool called Census Access, which anyone on the campus can upload a document to this tool and it will export it to a file of your choice, whether that's an MP3 file, an audio file, uh, Braille, uh, electronic Braille, or something else. And then Buffalo State College has made a really interesting and seamless transition for faculty uh, by providing buttons in their video software system for faculty to just submit videos for captioning. And they get the funding for that captioning by taking a portion of the tech fee to pay for accessibility. Binghamton, uh, their Center for Learning and Teaching, uh, offers a teaching online certification program and they provide compensation for faculty. Now, they're, they're uh, a little wealthier in this respect, but what's really neat is that professors are paid only if their course is fully accessible. Now, there are other quality course measures that are uh, assessed, but accessibility, the, the university has taken a firm stance that for that program, accessibility is central to teaching online, and so, they, uh, they really make it a priority there. Uh, some, and so this picture uh, that's on the screen right now is from uh, a, a number of our campuses who collaborated together to create a free massive open online course titled Accessibility Designing and Teaching Courses for All Learners. So that was a really cool collaboration and that course is actually still available. It's self-paced, it is free, and I'll provide that resource for you at the end. Now, private colleges are doing many of the same, th same accessibility interventions as SUNY, and like SUNY, they range in their accessibility culture from beginner to advanced. And I, I wanted to share this with you because while these campuses are not in New York, I think this is a really neat way that they're uh, addressing web accessibility. So this is the five college consortium uh, which comprises of Amherst, UMass Amherst, Hampshire College, Mount Holyoke College, and Smith College. And they share an electronic and information technology accessibility coordinator to help conduct trainings, uh, upgrade campus-wide assistive technology programs, and streamline collaboration among campuses to address accessibility needs. So I, I'm not sure if this is something that would fit uh, for your campus culture, but it's another way of looking at this. If you don't want to do it alone, there may be campuses in the region who are in the same boat and want to uh, develop, you know, some kind of collaboration together to address this as a team. So, I haven't really mentioned this, I've been mentioning standards this whole time, but I haven't told you what they are, so here they are. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Section 508. As, as it stands right now, this standard only applies to federal entities. Some states have adopted this, but um, 
you know, it's, it's, it's not something that people typically adopt. What, pe what colleges and universities typically adopt is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.0 AA. Uh, this is an international standard. There are three levels, A, AA, and AAA. And so if you adopt AA, that means you've also adopted A as well. Um, a is kind of the more uh, baseline level. Double A is more intermediate level of accessibility, and triple A is advanced. So at SUNY, you know, we did not explicitly adopt either of those standards. And I'll kind of give you some background why. So we established a system-wide electronic and information technology accessibility committee last year to devise a policy and guidelines for achieving digital accessibility. We have representation from all the sectors, the university centers, comprehensive colleges, agricultural tech colleges, and community colleges, and members from system administration, with expertise from folks in IT, purchasing, educational technologies, libraries, disability services, communications and marketing, and more. <laughs> And identifying standards is a critical part of the policy making. And so we talked about it and believe that technical standards are ever changing. And in an effort to avoid revising the EIT accessibility policy many times, we did not include specific technical standards in the policy language. In the policy, we point to the guidelines or procedure, which is easier for us to modify and provides numerous standards. So we modeled this policy framework after the Ohio State University and modeled the guidelines framework after the California State University system. They are truly models in this area. And so the committee split up into these five key priority areas, web development, digital content, procurement, classroom technologies, and libraries. And so, we actually wanted to create standards for each of these areas. We infused the WCAG 2.0 AA standards where relevant. So that was pretty much the web development and content design standards. And the reason why we have two different standards is there's some more things that web developers have to do than content designers. So we made a standard that is more for the web developer IT kind of person, and then the content design standards for more of the web editor, uh, student affairs, creating a flyer type of person, instructors, and so on. Um, and within these standards, we highlighted areas as high priority and best practice to clarify what's essential and what should be included. Because like I said before, you know, the standards are highly interpretable. So all of these groups interpreted the standards. We created a SUNY standard and, you know, they're meant to be a baseline and campuses will be encouraged to go above and beyond. Like I said, we're still working on these and hope to bring these forward to the board at the June meeting this year. Now, you have to adopt or customize technical standards. My advice to you would be to start with the WCAG. So check out the WCAG levels A and AA and see which items may logically apply to web developers, web editors, and faculty. Then see which items you already support, which you need to add, and ones which may be challenging to achieve. You don't want to adopt something you're not fully ready to support. You have to start somewhere and improve on accessibility over time. This, is, this isn't really a checkbox, like compliance isn't a checkbox. This is a continuous quality assurance area. So whether for, uh, oh, I'm on the wrong slide. So that's where we are. And I ask you to ask yourself, where are you? Are you um, at the more of a beginner level? Are you more established? What do you know about what your direct area is doing to enhance Accessibility. What do you know about what your institution is doing? Whether for an individual course, a department website, other university life pages, 
you need to identify barriers, assess impact, make a plan for new content, and have a process in place to remediate older content, at least a process to remediate it upon request. And of course, provide training. So, you know, the benefits of doing this are invaluable. Assuring quality proactively reduces liability, improves access and user experience for all, promotes meaningful independence, reduces stigma, improves the campus climate, and gains competitive advantage. By addressing the campus culture around disability and accessibility, this can really contribute to improved social and educational outcomes uh, and also support staff with disabilities. And, you know, the campus climate piece is really important because if you want to attract staff and faculty with disabilities, because we know our students with disabilities may want mentors uh, who do have disabilities, uh, that, that really kind of adds to uh, another level there. And at a time when enrollment is competitive, these efforts could increase market share and reach. And also, again, the equity piece, it's also a, a return on investment for the state. So if education is linked to our higher pay, we'll have more people with disabilities in the economy and less relying on disability, and it'll just be really great. And we know that people with disabilities provide unique perspectives to contribute to economy. People with disabilities drive innovation. Look at all of these famous people who have greatly contributed to our culture and educational institutions. So uh, for, for those of you wondering, is it Stevie Wonder's on there, Albert Einstein, Channing Tatum, Frida Kahlo, Mark Ruffalo, Solange Knowles, Helen Keller, Stephen Hawking, Agatha Christie, Mozart, Whoopi Goldberg, and FDR. And what I like about this list is because some of these folks have visible disabilities, but some of them have invisible disabilities as well. So it's really important to look at providing opportunities for our, our students with disabilities, faculty and staff with disabilities to be successful. <clears throat> Takeaways here, you know, accessibility requires cooperative oversight. You want to build accessibility into your existing workflows. Be aware of the barriers and have a plan to provide access. I can't stress that enough. Realistically, organizations are going to be both proactive and reactive. You can be reactive, but if you haven't planned ahead, you have to be able to, quick, to, be able to provide meaningful, timely, and equivalent access. This may seem like a lot, and you, know, you can't fix everything all at once. Try to find a middle ground and continue to improve your processes balance between a commitment to accessible websites and related technologies and acquiring the materials and products you need and want to support your institutions. So in sum, create, acquire, and provide meaningfully accessible virtual environments from the beginning and have procedures in place to remediate access issues quickly. Fundamentally, we exist to support a marketplace of ideas. As we increasingly move our learning and engagements to virtual spaces, we must be mindful of access and inclusion to support the diversity of thought and advancement of innovation. And here are some ways, uh, here are some things that you can do right now to improve accessibility on your campus. A number of these recommendations are from research at the National Center for College Students with Disabilities um, and you know, things that other campuses are doing uh, and, and, and have demonstrated to prove them well. So I'm happy to take questions at this time. Comments, discussion. I think you can un unmute yourself as well. Nasley, can you hear me? I know I unpacked just a lot of information and you might be uh, <laughs> digesting it all. So I understand if you don't have any questions at this time, uh, I'm happy to share 
additional resources with you so you can go and look into this for yourself a little bit further, what this means to you in your respective areas. And here are some resources, listservs and professional organizations to consult, legal and technical resources. And someone asked if I could go back to the last slide again. Oops, I'm going. Um, can you hear okay. me now? Awesome. And and this presentation will be available to you. And like I said, I also have a handout to share uh, in more detail some of the accessibility considerations from earlier in my presentation and a wealth of resources at your fingertips. Kristen has a question. Can you speak about what SUNY is doing in support of online courses? Yes. In terms of accessibility, uh, there's a lot that's going on at a system level and at the individual campuses. So we have what's called Open SUNY, uh, which is a, a neat entity that provides uh, certification and courses and pro academic programs uh, from various campuses. And so Open SUNY has a course quality rubric called the OSCAR rubric, and the OSCAR rubric has been adopted by the Online Learning Consortium, and this course rubric includes accessibility uh, within the rubric, and many of those items are from the WCAG 2.0 standards. So there's that. They encourage folks to use that, that rubric, and many of our campuses have adopted that rubric. Uh, you may have heard of Quality Matters. That's another kind of rubric. I'm not too familiar with whether uh, that has accessibility consider considerations uh, built into that rubric, but I do know that our rubric does. So uh, that is actually the rubric that is being used at Binghamton University's uh, teaching online certification program to evaluate the quality and accessibility of the online courses. Another thing that we're doing, Open SUNY has also invested in Blackboard Ally. Uh, Blackboard Ally is not just for Blackboard. Uh, it's Ally. Ally is a tool that can be used in the learning management system, and it's a really neat educational tool. Uh, it's been adopted by a number of our campuses, and we're we just started it this spring, so I can't I can't share anything uh, good or bad about it, other than it provides ways for students and faculty to uh, assess the level of accessibility in their individual course uh, for the entire our learning management system. It teaches you, uh, it tells you how accessible your documents and things are. So if it's at 10%, it'll say, hey, you know, this document is at 10% accessibility. Here's what you can do to make it better. It kind of walks you through how to make it accessible. On the student side, students can download your documents um, and and make them into a, like convert them into a more accessible format or a preferred format of their choice. So if you're an oral learner and you want to download Professor X's uh, PDF uh, reading for tomorrow night, you can convert that to an MP3 file. So uh, we have a good number of campuses. I think 25 plus are using Ally, and it can be used in other uh, other platforms like Canvas and Moodle, I believe. So there's that. Um, campuses have a bunch of instructional designers that really support faculty in the creation of their 
had a, you know, of their, of their course tools and, and content. And so accessibility is a hugely discussed area amongst our instructional designer uh, groups. And so they're always trying to get faculty to come in, evaluate their courses, um, provide new ways and new tools and new easy buttons for ensuring accessibility for their videos and, and things like that. So uh, I, that's what I can say about what SUNY is doing to support the online courses and accessibility. Yeah, it really, it, you know, it, it sounds perhaps like this might be uh, more strongly emphasized in, court, in, in programs that are fully online, but that really isn't the case. You know, a lot, of, a lot of folks use the learning management system whether they're fully online or not, and so um, it's, it's important to, uh, you know, maintain accessible course documents and such in multimedia because, you know, people are accessing them even though your courses aren't fully online. No one has any additional questions. I will leave this here for you. And feel free to contact me anytime. We have courses available as well uh, that are not just open to SUNY, but I know you have a ton of professional development opportunities on your campus, which look excellent, by the way. And I'll stop talking now because it seems like everyone's good. No, thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure to meet you all virtually.